All right, so this is the start of like a tour video of Pine Ridge Reservation, and we're not on the reservation right now, but we're in the town of White Clay, which is kind of like the gateway to Pine Ridge. Uh, the importance of this town is, it is just south of the reservation, and it's a small town right across the border in Nebraska. Uh, the thing that makes this important is because there's a bar right behind me, and alcohol is illegal on the reservation. So bars and alcohol plants from around the country ship their booze here and this small town has some of the highest traffic rates coming through it because people seek uh seek this escape here in white clay and it's created it's like a source of pain for a lot of people and a lot of people think it should be uh taken care of or there should be rules and regulations placed on it i kind of agree with it but I kind of also think that that would create uh, a bigger black market for it. I just think there should be better education, but uh, the town of White Clay is interesting and very small, and that's behind me. I'm here at the Red Cloud Indian School, and behind me is the grave of Chief Red Cloud. He died in 1909, and he's seen as kind of a hero of the Lakota people. A lot of people seem to think that he was the chief of all Lakota tribes, and they were united under his leadership, but this is only partly true as the chief of several tribes. But the important part to know is that he's kind of seen as a hero of the American Indian movement because that movement was pan-Indian. It wasn't just tribal, it was advocating the rights of Native Americans across the country and in other parts of the Americas and South America too. And Red Cloud started out fighting the U.S. Cavalry, the U.S. Army in the wars over here against settlers and helping his people. But after this, he kind of helped transition his people to the reservation life. Uh, he's seen as a hero to many people. And elsewhere in this cemetery, if we can find it, is the grave of Pedro Bissonnette, which is important because I am very interested in the more modern history of Wounded Knee in the Pine Ridge area. And Pedro Bissonnette is a relatively unknown figure in uh, the, the Wounded Knee standoff in 1973, where they occupied Wounded Knee. I'll go into that in more detail uh, when we reach Wounded Knee. But he was the lead up to the Wounded Knee 1973. He was the head of the uh, Oscro group, the I forget what the uh, acronym stood for, but essentially he was an expert on the FBI shootout at the Jumping Bull compound, and he had information that would exonerate the two people that had been implicated in the murder of two FBI agents. He also was an expert on the Dick Wilson regime, which the Oscar movement was attempting to impeach him as the head of the Indian Reservation. And he was found, he had too much information, and he was arrested on trumped up charges in uh, Rapid City. And they said, uh, you can be an FBI informant or we can uh, imprison you for 99 years. And he said a very noble quote, basically, I refuse, I will serve my people and I'm ready to die. And die he did. He was found with a gunshot wound. The Bureau of Indian Affairs said that he intimidated one of the agents by knocking them over and they shot him. Uh, the autopsy report said the bullet shot came from two feet away from a pistol and Dennis Banks, one of the heads of the American Indian movement, said that it was a federal assassination conspiracy. Uh, Pedro Bissonnette was murdered by the Bureau of Indian Affairs and I would implicate Dick Wilson and the federal government in it because these people were for, were for more Indian sovereignty. They wanted more self-choices on the reservation, but the federal government was elbowing their way in. And uh, Bissonnette was, was going to help exonerate his people in the shootout, and uh, this just wasn't going to fly with the federal government. And I hope we can find his grave here, but it would also be interesting to show all the World War II graves and all of the Indian scout graves because they served their country. And it's kind of amazing how much we screwed them over and how they just went back to serve us anyway because uh, they're good people. United States Marine Corps. 
This is the Wounded Knee Massacre Memorial. And you can see pictures. On December 29, 1890, the U.S. 7th Cavalry was escorting Indians between the reservations. And the cause of this was there was a request made on the part of the cavalry for one of the elders to turn over one of his guns. And there was a request made on the part of the cavalry for one of the elders to turn in his gun. And he said, basically, no, this is mine for hunting. Uh, so somebody, there was a scuffle. And the accepted version of events now is that a scuffle broke out and someone started dancing the ghost dance. And this scared the cavalry who were stationed on the hills around here. I'm trying to find, I think this is one of the hills that the machine gun was on. They mounted four Hotchkiss machine guns around this camp of mostly women, children, and elderly men uh, because they were scared. And when they saw the ghost dance, it, it terrifies them. So they opened fire and an unusual number of medals of honor were awarded for this action, even though 39 U.S. cavalry died and it was mostly from friendly fire. Uh, there's some other interesting sites in this memorial that I'd like to see. The grave of Lost Bird and the grave of uh, somebody who was sniped in the Wounded East standoff because uh, in 1973 we've already visited the cemetery where Pedro Bissonnet was buried but that Oscro attempt to get Dick Wilson impeached was denied and they became very angry and members of the American Indian movement led by Dennis Banks and Russell Means helped organize control over this town. The chairman of the tribal council, Dick Wilson, against whom the Ravels leveled many complaints, toured the village this morning. I expected this. What? They're hoodlums, clowns. This is the way they live. They took it over, and there was a federal standoff for 71 days, 77, I think 71 days, and uh, the FBI came out, the military came out, uh, there were tanks, there were guns. They were just sniping these these Native Americans and it was uh, terrible and the whole world saw it and this was also I blame I blame Richard Nixon I blame the FBI and a lot of people who didn't need to die lost their lives we're just about coming up to uh, a decision in this wounded knee thing I have been the oh boy exercising <laughs> great restraint in that right. you know, ever since it began uh, but two or three weeks, ten days, sometime or another, we're going to have to figure a cut date out there. And I'd like some time to, uh, when it's convenient for you, to come over and talk to you about it. Okay, so right next to this memorial, a lot of people don't know the history of Lawrence Lamont, and he kind of facilitated the end of the federal siege on Wounded Knee. Uh, he was, I guess by all accounts, just walking, and on April 26th, he was shot by a federal sniper in the head. And the tribal elders kind of convened, and they talked about what should be done and they finally agreed that the world had seen enough and that a ceasefire should be declared and on may 8th the uh the members of wounded knee roughly 200 uh native people in the american indian movement uh started leaving through federal federal lines and walking off into the hills many of them were arrested uh and also uh just as an aside, uh, because there is no grave for him here, but there might be a memorial one day, is the grave or the remains somewhere in these hills of Buddy Robinson, I believe was his name. He was a, an African-American civil rights activist. And uh, his story is he came in and uh, he was attempting to help these Native Americans in the cause. And by all accounts, for decades, he just vanished. He walked off into the night and disappeared but decades later came out he didn't follow orders he was eating all the food and the native americans uh 
they didn't take too kindly to it and to his lack of coordination and ex obedience to orders being given and apparently he, he tried to jump somebody he reached for his knife and they killed him and buried his body somewhere off in the hills and the FBI has kind of since then implicated a lot of people who were high up in the American Indian movement and I think it's just an interesting part of the story uh, another part of the story this was Wounded Knee was taken over in 1973 symbolically in protest through Oscro of the denial of the impeachment of Dick Wilson, the president of the Indian Reservation. Roughly 200 natives came and this resulted in a 77 day standoff and this is, they, they occupied it symbolically for the mass grave here of, I, I can't even, uh, Count. I, there's a lot. Um, I think over 150 people died. But interesting, there are still one or two more sites that I'd like to see here. We were just up at the cemetery, and we didn't make any video for a lost bird's grave. So quickly, her story is: she was found. Uh, her mother, when she died, clutched her in her arms as a four-month-old infant, and uh, a National Guard. A uh, cavalry person found her days later, three days later, and she became more of a souvenir. He said that he, she was a souvenir of the, the massacre, and she had a child out of wedlock. A lot of people think it was to the National Guard general who kept her, and she was forced to have an abortion and go to a mental clinic, uh, and died in California, and decades later they buried her right next to where her mother is buried in the grave up there, but we spoke to a local who told us that they found six FBI bunkers around here and buried in this graveyard if you walk in on the right hand side is members of the American Indian movement and members of the two families because there's four different families in this reservation uh, American Indian movement is on the right and they're commemorated every uh, February 22nd but they come in with their guns and they do a salute uh, and on the left you have the goons which is, uh, I forget the family name, but they were the people who were anti-American Indian movement. Right in front of the graveyard was the old church that was burned down in 1973. And uh, there's a spring behind me where they would give birth. And, and there was four families that came here. They had POW numbers, so they were POWs for living in America. Uh, many people fought in five different wars from this reservation. Very patriotic, I, I think. It's kind of uh, bad that we did so many terrible things to them and they still helped us anyway but he said interestingly one second interestingly he said over 200 bodies were found people who uh they disappeared at the hands of the fbi and during the uh the siege 12 people died 12 people dis disappeared members of the american indian movement and uh it's a wild history didn't even intend on seeing this, but this is the uh, the transmitter that was bought by members of the American Indian Movement. It was the first kind of like reservation transmitter, and it's transmitting to all the separate Lakota reservations in, in uh, South Dakota and I think a couple in North Dakota, but it was bought by the American Indian Movement. And this is uh, just out outside of Porcupine. I forget the station. I'll put a link in the uh, description of the video. but. Yeah, kind of really scenic. And all this town has only come about since the 1990s. Uh, in the 70s, all the buildings burned down. The church burned down, just very sad. But let me see, oh yeah, if I zoom in, maybe you can see it. Keeley Radio, there's the building. Of uh, Lakota Republic? Oh, 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 go around him. What? Save that clip. <laughs> I'm gonna save the clip. All right, ignore that, guys. Uh, back in 2008, they declared Lakota Republic an independent place, but they've been doing it since Wounded Knee. I think uh, the members of the American Indian Movement declared the reservation an independent state. Uh, of course, nobody recognized it, but they declared this is the capital, Porcupine, which is just a stone's throw away from Wounded Knee. The leadership of the Indian Nation here on Wounded Knee Wounded knee, an independent country. Any spy from the United States of America is found within our borders. We will be dealt with as any spy at a time of war. Wait a minute, okay, it's on. <laughs>
So my spiel about the Indian head nickel. Now that we pass through Wounded Knee, north of Wounded Knee, behind the Prairie Winds Hotel and Resort, is the grave of the chief that was on that nickel. Three different chiefs were uh, modeled for that, and this chief is famous because he was one of the last survivors of the American Indian Wars, and I believe he also survived the Wounded Knee Massacre. And he was part of one of the last federal land grabs of Indian land. People seem to only remember the Trail of Tears and the Cherokee land grabs and out west, but it happened as recently as 1947 when they took land from 150 plus uh, Lakota families, uh, young children and also mostly very elderly, and they took their farmlands and he testified in front of Congress and he said, I'm afraid I'm going to freeze to death this winter, I have no food and you took my farm. And it's kind of a disservice to just history to do that. and. Uh, He's buried, I think, in a Catholic church cemetery, but we can't seem to find it, and it's above the hotel, and it's somewhere out in these hills, and I have no information on the Catholic church, if it still exists or not, but there's a lot of churches out here, uh, but I don't seem to see it. So he's buried somewhere in these hills, in an unmarked grave.